As soon as I got outside, I seen two cops, and they must have thought I was the I was the one causing the problems or something. Handcuffed me and took me to the car, and I'm thinking I didn't break no laws, so I didn't do nothing wrong, and took me away. And they drove me out of town. Scared the heck out of me. I thought I was dead. All those rumors I heard in the past, they were all coming true. When they told me, Daryl, get the heck out. Well, they swore I out. Up an Indian. I told them I freeze to death out here, you guys. And they stopped. You can hear the tires crunching on the snow. And I can hear the electric window go down. And I remember that driver there I said, that's your effing problem. And they drove away. But Daryl Knight is lucky. Despite darkness and bitter cold, he makes his way through the snow to a nearby power station. A passing security guard somehow hears the pounding on the door. The next day, another Aboriginal man is found in the same area where the police abandoned Daryl. 25-year-old Rodney Nastus was not so lucky. His frozen body is discovered by a politician out for her daily jog. He was last seen drinking with friends and was expected at the home of his cousin, who lives in the same building where Daryl Knight was picked up. Two days later, Sergeant Bruce A. Halt of the Saskatoon Police Service pulls Daryl Knight and his uncle over for a seatbelt ticket. Neither Daryl nor the sergeant realize that their brief meeting will eventually lead to one of the most shocking revelations against a police force in Canadian history. Daryl and his uncle have heard about the freezing death of Rodney Nastis and question the veteran sergeant. I asked them why they were interested in that particular event. And uh, in talking with them, they relayed the information that they, uh, they felt that it was related to the same type of incident that had happened to Daryl. I told them, yeah, the cops dropped me off out of the town by the power station there. I sort of took up the conversation with them, asked them if they had reported that particular incident to the police service. And the comment was made was, who's going to believe me? I didn't think he'd believe me, you know that? Uh, there's a number of things that went through my mind, and I guess the, one of the first ones was, uh, this can't really be happening. And uh, I, I just felt that uh, the, uh, the badge and the, uh, and the uniform that I represented to this community was damaged. But I did ask them for some time. And the reason I asked for that time was so that I could begin an investigation, uh, relay the information to uh, Chief Dave Scott, who was my chief at the time. And uh, that way there was, um, it gave us time to find out exactly what was going on. Next day, that cop that pulled us over, he pulls up. What does he want? I was thinking. And he goes, Daryl, Daryl, come here. I was scared to go over there. 
Michael, what do you want, copper? Because remember you were telling me nobody will believe you? And I go, yeah. I believe you, he said. One day after Bruce Ahalt believes Daryl Knight, a second frozen body is discovered in a field by the power station. 29-year-old Lawrence Wagner was a student at the First Nations University. Police tell his family that Lawrence must have walked to the remote area and died of hypothermia. Good evening. Harsh allegations against two Saskatoon police officers. They're accused of mistreating a native man. And at the same time, an investigation is being launched into the mysterious deaths of two other Aboriginal men. Pia Chattopadhyay reports. Good morning. A brave face well, from like a police is, chief to fearing the worst. To a chronology of events here. And we have nothing that would indicate that they are related. The person being dropped off or the two people that were found. This morning, the chief said what happened during the past few weeks would be at the center of two separate but internal police investigations. He was firm. The police could and would investigate two of their own officers. But the Saskatoon police are under pressure. Hours later, Chief Dave Scott reverses his decision and turns the investigation over to the RCMP. The city is growing suspicious of its police. 400 people, Aboriginal and white, join Lawrence Wagner's family in a march to police headquarters. A cold vigil to remember Lawrence and Rodney and to acknowledge decades of police mistreatment of Aboriginal people. Lawrence Wagner walked in two worlds. His father is German, his mother is Aboriginal. I needed to be around with a lot of people, and I know that people care, the ones that walk with us. It's just like a, it was the right thing to do. You can feel it in the air. It struck me that the extreme cold that I was experiencing, wearing a jacket and gloves and stuff like that, that I realized that there's no way that he walked out of town in, in properly dressed the way that they claimed that he was. After when we walked uh, down to the police station, I just had a, a sense of mis mistrust, uh, a sense of we're not hearing all the truth right, out, right from the very beginning. new things there was always a lot of why questions even when he um, started school the teachers were saying that they can give them enough because he just soak it up like a sponge they were such fast learners Lawrence always found learning very easy and um, he's very bright and very smart in 1980, I lost my brother. He died, eh? and Lawrence was the one that comforted me. He just, I was kind of annoyed with him because I wanted to be alone, eh? but he kept following me. Eh? And he said, are you all right, my mom? And he was only 11 years old. We've raised our, our children to be proud of, of who you are 
and you're just as much native as you are German. It should have been a little bit more recognized that he was a human being. Daryl Knight survived to identify the officers who dropped him off that night. But the freezing deaths of Rodney Nastis and Lawrence Wagner remain unexplained. The public wants answers, and a large RCMP task force is set up to investigate. The lack of trust in police, all police, motivates the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations to bring in one of their own. Oliver Williams is a retired RCMP officer with 24 years experience. He makes the move from his reserve in Interior, BC to Saskatoon. Policing is a really hard profession. I, I think it's one of the hardest professions, bar none. And I, I think if you get police officers there that ha have a racist attitude, that uh, do things a certain way, well, of course, it, it reflects on all the other police officers. And unfortunately, what goes on is you have a generation of policemen that pass these work habits on to others, and pretty soon it becomes normal. This is the way you do things. The easy answer would be to get rid of a generation of policemen, <laughs> but uh, no, the reality of it is you can't do that. So what we have to do, I think, is concentrate on the uh, younger officers and, uh, and, and hopefully change the way that they do business. Oliver takes charge of the Special Investigations Unit at the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations. He shadows the RCMP task force, looking into the deaths of Rodney Nastis and Lawrence Wagner, the abandonment of Daryl Knight and other similar incidents. He opens a toll-free line to receive historic and current complaints against police across the province. In the first few weeks, his unit receives over 800 calls. A lot of the complainants that I've talked to refused or did not want to come forward because they were fearful of reprisal. And at first, I thought, well, how can you fear the police like that? But after talking to them, I found it to be a really genuine fear that they had. And I, I think that's the biggest challenge uh, that the Saskatoon City Police are going to uh, have to overcome in the next two years, is to, to get rid of that fear that people have. OK, uh, this is further to, to your call uh, about that incident you had with, uh, with the police last Saturday night. What I want you to do is uh, tell me in as much detail as you can recall what took place. You know, if someone had started, taken me and uh, told me that this is what you're going to encounter when you go out there to do this, I would have said, no way, that's, that's just not, doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. But I've had my eyes open big time. And, and I guess I, I go through a gauntlet of emotions here in that I, I look at it from the perspective of a police officer and I, I'm really ashamed at some of the stuff that I have encountered that I, I, I see that police officers have, have been involved and are responsible for. And then uh, as a citizen, as a, as a just a ordinary Joe, I'm appalled. I truly am. As a First Nations person, I'm angry, I'm hurt. And uh, so I, I go through all those emotions when, when I when I encounter these things. Were these all friends of yours that were in the vehicle with yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, they were all Okay, you know, uh, they, they witnessed what happened, eh? Yeah. Okay, you think you've seen it all and heard it all and you're pretty, pretty well hardened to everything, but there was many, many times when, when I cried. <laughs> you know, when you're alone in the car and uh, just to think that these things happened and just, just shouldn't have happened. Saskatoon is a city connected by bridges and divided by race. It has the largest urban population of Aboriginal people in a province with the highest youth incarceration rate in North America. In Saskatchewan, a young Aboriginal man is more likely to go to jail than finish high school. It's okay, girls. It's okay. It's okay. We're just watching the babysitters for now. Few people understand the history behind the statistics, and many don't care. What are your conditions? Uh, no drinking, no weapons. Okay. 
What else? Oh, you're gonna search me for a weapon. Yeah, I am too. Don't be nervous, man. Okay, you got a curfew on you? Uh, not that I know of. Okay, Mike, keep your hands in your pocket, buddy. Hands in your pocket. Okay, what's gonna happen here is if you're gonna stay exactly put, all right? until the other car gets here, and then I'm just gonna patch you for weapons, check and see if you've got a curfew, all right? Nothing sudden or I'll put you on the ground, you understand, yeah. understand that, eh? Aboriginal right people in the prairies have coped with assaults led by the church and the Canadian government, okay. residential school abuse, discriminations in the Indian Act, racism, and despair. These are the people the Saskatoon police meet on a nightly basis. No, no, I don't fucking know your name. What's going on? Wow. Does, do you know this guy? Hey, do you know this guy? Does he live here? Uh, no, don't know much. Where's your shoes? My shoes? Yeah. Well, why? Well, because you can't be walking around if you don't live here. You're intoxicated in a public place. No, I don't live here. Where do you live? If you don't give me an address now, I'm taking you in. Give me an address. I don't have an address. Okay, you're coming with me, Diego. Good chance, my back. You're under arrest. This guy's taking you for a ride here. No, but can I, can I, can I, can I have a ride? Yeah, we're giving you a ride to our place. For tonight, he's just going to sleep it off and uh, he'll be released tomorrow. He was, uh, he, was, uh, he was in there with no shoes on, so I don't know where he came from or what his address was, so they'll uh, find him an old pair of shoes in detention in the morning and uh, strap him on his feet and off he'll go again until probably another night when I'm sure he'll do it over and over again, I guess, so. I think policing is a very, very difficult job. Most police officers are good quality people, without question. They're there for the right reasons, and I want to help those people. I want to help those people do their job and, and, and improve their relations. When you're ready to come down to the station, bring that with you? The others, I'd like to turn them all out, <laughs> and I'll do my best to make sure that's done, too. One who is there for the right reasons is Craig Nerfa, a 14-year veteran of the Saskatoon Police he has been their Aboriginal liaison officer for nine years. His Peacekeepers program brings together Aboriginal youth and police officers in positive ways. Basketball games, bike rides, and a yearly canoe trip. Craig was the first officer to reach out to the Wagner family. The biggest thing for me when I became the Aboriginal liaison officer was just uh, how much I've learned in that time. And going into the position, assuming um, that uh, I had a relatively good knowledge of policing issues and just what the Aboriginal community would want and how we could help the Aboriginal community, but then very quickly starting to realize that it was actually the other way around and that I began, I became the person who was learning as opposed to the Aboriginal community. The way that I think now, I find myself questioning uh, some of the things that are within the justice system because of how they conflict with ways in which, say, First Nations people would look at the justice system and the way First Nations people would look at policing. Don Worm is a lawyer. His email handle is Legal Warrior. His firm represents Daryl Knight and the family of Lawrence Wagner. It was pretty clear to us growing up uh, within our community that there were uh, all kinds of inequities that needed to be addressed and so it, it was almost a natural movement towards uh, this particular profession in the hopes that, uh, that not just me but other of my family members who are all too interested and involved in this area could make a difference and we continue with that struggle. It certainly was the area that Daryl Knight was dumped in on that cold night in January of 2000. Fortunately, uh, he was able to make his way back to that power station and was able to summon assistance and by doing so was able to preserve his life and as a result of that and the complaint that he subsequently laid, uh, a number of other issues have since come to light. Those issues being, of course, the other frozen individuals that were found and obviously it inspired a deeper look at some other instances that occurred in the past. Good evening. Two Saskatoon police officers have been charged with assault and unlawful confinement. 
The charges were laid after an Aboriginal man claimed police abandoned him outside Saskatoon. The case has sparked a national debate about how police treat minorities. Constables Ken Munson and Dan Hatchin admit to abandoning Daryl Knight in the cold at the edge of town. As the case progresses, emotions run high in the city of Saskatoon. Thoughts that usually remain unsaid are now in the open. Why are these two taking the blame for everyone taking that's dead? The blame. It's not their fault that everyone's They're dead. They're just lucky that Daryl Knight found the phone to phone a cab. Uh, Daryl Knight, <laughs> please. What about his arrest record? What Get about the out. trouble that man's been Does in? Does that mean he should die? No, that doesn't mean he should die. Nobody should die. No one at all should have to die Your and pay the of price. Your racism is what I've been fighting No, all I'm not life. racist because my Look friends are Indian as well. Anyone my that says I'm not my best friends are Indian. Racist. But I, yeah, sure, some I may have. Some of my friends are Indian Some too. of my friends are, and yeah, I have a certain amount of racism because I've dealt with enough of Native that have caused me nothing but hell and havoc. Broke into my homes. Yeah. Why okay. You have done that to me. Well, my nose fine. Is broken. I have. I, how holes many beers do you drink, and how much bigo do you do? Body. And how much, yeah, how much like welfare are you guys on? The responses that Mr. Hatchin and Mr. Munson gave at their trial were totally unsatisfactory, not only to Daryl, but I would suggest to you that they were totally unsatisfactory to anybody who heard them. As a matter of fact, their version of events was that Daryl asked them to drop him off outside of town on a cold night. Nobody can accept that. There was no indication on their part that they saw Daryl as anything other than what Daryl testified to, and that was a drunken Indian. Saskatoon police officers Ken Munson and Dan Hatchin are fired after they are convicted on the charge of unlawful confinement in the Daryl Knight case they are found not guilty of assault. They are sentenced to eight months in the Provincial Correctional Center and will be out in four. I guess my feeling after the Daryl Knight incident was, um, was also one of anger because I had felt that in a way the, I was being let down by, uh, by, by these two members uh, in, in our police service and in the work we are trying to do. Throughout the nine years that I've been in this position now, I've become very close to people I work with and uh, have developed a lot of friendships and a lot of um, very, very strong friendships. And so that affects you personally when all of a sudden you're not dealing with someone who's just a stranger. Uh, you are working and uh, you see the pain from people who have become very close to you. And so I always, um, it's almost like you feel the pain yourself when you see the pain through them. And I think that makes a big difference. Do you know how many times you got pulled over in the last two weeks because I was Aboriginal? Do you want to know why? Do you want to know how many times? 12, 16, yeah. Five times I got pulled over for nothing because I was walking down 21st Street. And for what? I asked him, you got a problem? The conviction of Munson and Hatchin in the Daryl Knight incident doesn't help the families of Rodney Nastis or Lawrence Wagner. They want to know why these young men froze to death at the edge of town. It still saddened me. How can anybody leave a person out here? And uh, in the middle of a cold night, to me, that's heartless. I remember picking one like this when we came down here. I wanted to take something home from here where, where they found his body, eh? I was just grasping for anything, I guess, because I felt so empty when I lost my mom. It was okay because, uh, uh, she did her living, eh? she wasn't young anymore. 
it's different when your own child passes away. They really didn't want to say too much how he got out there. And um, so, okay, well, he was found out there. Uh, can we go see the body and stuff like this? And they said, well, not really because he's still frozen. And, but my wife did go in and picked up the clothing and uh, brought the clothing back. And I noticed that uh, they, they said he was wearing a T-shirt, underwear, pants, and two pair of socks, and that's all. And I said, no shoes. And he said, no, no jacket. And I they also said, no. And I told the wife, something doesn't add up, because if he wandered out there in his socks, I said, there's something strange about this, because there weren't any holes in his socks. The evidence was pretty clear that those socks were not worn. And the suggestion, therefore, that he walked from downtown to there, it, it was simply unbelievable. It was incredible evidence. There were officers from the RCM police who did the investigation, who put on the same socks. And after walking a matter of blocks, uh, the socks were completely worn through. They were, uh, their feet were dirty. So to suggest that Mr. Wagner walked from downtown without wearing his socks, it, it's incredible. The RCMP task force concludes there is insufficient evidence to lay charges in the freezing deaths of Rodney Nastis or Lawrence Wagner. Subsequent coroner's inquests rule cause of death as undetermined. The most difficult thing about the inquests, both the Wagner and Nastis inquests, is that there was no closure for the families. Uh, this was a way of uh, appeasing everyone. Well, you know, the answer is to have an inquest here. Uh, if there's not enough evidence to charge anyone or to see that someone's involved, we'll just have an inquest and everybody will be happy and go home. Well, that's not the case. And uh, to this day, there are still so many unanswered questions and so much suspicion there that uh, I, I don't know if that'll ever get resolved unless someone comes forward and admits to doing something. It doesn't look right for a lot of uh, people to die out there. That's what, uh, I don't understand that. I don't understand why they have to talk about Lawrence when he's dead. The kind of life he led and, you know, it wasn't even true. Most of it wasn't even true. I don't understand that uh, a drug addict to be any treated different the way they said about my son. He, at first, he was human being. Is it okay for the drug addicts to die? Undesirable people around the world? I don't think so. It seems like we're not valued as human beings. We're, we're Indians. In addition to Hatchin and Munson, the revelations now take another career. Dave Scott is fired as chief of police. An outsider is brought in to take his place. Aboriginal elders reach out to new police chief, Russ Sable. When I came here, it became obvious that uh, there was a, an issue. Um, in this city, in Saskatoon, with the way that Aboriginal peoples were treated um, differently than, than others. When I got hired, Walter um, made arrangements in the Aboriginal community to have a traditional swearing-in ceremony um, using Aboriginal, uh, the Aboriginal culture and, and uh, ceremonies. And uh, it, was a, it was an absolutely moving experience for me. It was very humbling for our elders, um, all giving prayers uh, on my behalf and hoping to heal the, uh, the rift that was there between the Aboriginal community and, and the police. Walter Linklater is a constant presence throughout the conflict. He has been Craig Nerfa's advisor for years and has helped the Wagner family. 
His is a voice of advice for the new chief. We have to have a serious look at finding appropriate cultural ways to help our people. You know, and this is what uh, Craig Nerfa is attempting to do through his work, and this is what the elders are attempting to do in their work. Like we all have to work together to prevent these, these things from happening in the future. And there are different ways to work with our people. You know, from a non-native point of view, uh, sometimes they find it very difficult to work with our people because they don't understand our culture. We kept the same message that we were given to Chief Scott. It was the same message we give to Chief Sable, as to get involved in our ceremonies so that you learn the cultural appropriate ways to begin to establish trust. And he, he promised us as well to begin uh, a period of uh, cultural awareness, uh, not only for himself, but for his senior officers, as well as for the force, the police force in general to have uh, cultural awareness. We can't uh, correct that, you know, the, the difference between us and the police overnight. Like that's one thing that we all have to understand. It's going to take time. Sabo got the chief's job because of his community policing style and creates 10 new community liaison positions, which is out of step with the hard line favored by some within Saskatoon's police force. He slowly becomes aware of brewing internal attacks and an upcoming non-confidence vote by members of the force. We want to make sure that whatever you guys do, we're communicating that um, because you guys are fighting a battle. You're fighting a battle, first of all, you know, the perception internally is, well, take the 10 officers and throw them out in the street and we'll, ha we'll handle crime better. So you got to fight that, that perception. On the other side, you got the people out in the, out in the in the community who are saying, well, we never see uh, our officers. So we want to make sure we, we have a nice balance in there. So, um, But it's really important that, uh, that you guys understand this is, a, this is a huge hinge pin, I suppose, for lack of a better term, for where we're going with this organization. And you guys are the ones that can set the standard. As part of his community-based strategy, Sable opens the Little Chief Station in the inner city. Constable Larry Hartwig is one of the new community liaison officers assigned to Little Chief. I've worked on three different reserves, and I've developed a healthy respect for the Aboriginal community. Hello, is that in? We always have to be very, very careful as police officers because we have a tremendous amount of authority. And with that comes a tremendous amount of responsibility we must never, ever, ever abuse our authority as, as police officers. We have the authority to literally destroy lives. We literally do have that authority. And we must always be careful that that authority is never, ever abused. SIP entries on CPIC. Let me give you a little insight into what the police subculture is. We do not identify ourselves as white, as Aboriginal, as uh, African American or African Canadian or Asian. We choose not to, because when we become police officers, we become blue. When you talk to uh, to police officers, uh, they they don't uh, admit to this blue wall. It exists. There's no question about it. I mean, I was part of that uh, that profession, and I know that it exists. And uh, I think you see it time and time again when a, an officer that was there is uh, interviewed with regard to what he saw. You know, they didn't see anything, they were busy doing this or busy doing that, and that's a bunch of crap. In a lot of cases, they know exactly what happened, but they, they just don't say. From the beginning, the Saskatoon police had taken the position that Daryl Knight was an isolated incident. Some know this is false. Sabo does not. I'm not saying there weren't. I'm, what I'm saying is I don't know personally of any of those incidents that may have happened. When a reporter pushes him to look deeper, Sabo does his own investigation, finding drop-offs from as far back as the 1970s. And then he does the unexpected. We had indicated, as I understand, that uh, we didn't have any other incidents of this nature, and in fact, we have. And that's come to my attention, and I think we have to take ownership of things that have, have transpired. It happened more than once, and uh, we fully admit that. And in fact, um, 
on behalf of the of the police department, I want to apologize to those people who uh, who who we had said it, it it was a one of a kind incident. The chief's apology coincides with the outcome of an RCMP task force investigation into the death of 17-year-old Neil Stonechild, an Aboriginal teenager found frozen to death in 1990. The Saskatoon police had concluded their original investigation into his death after three days with no explanation and no charges. New pressure compels Saskatchewan Justice to hold a commission of inquiry into Neil's death and the allegations of a poor police investigation. It can't find criminal responsibility, but its mandate is to search for the truth. Now, the new chief must face the fact that there is a witness who places Neil Stonechild in the back of a Saskatoon police car on the last night of his life. Jason Roy was Neil's friend. A police car pulled in front of me. And Neil was in the back. From the moment that he saw me, he was, he was very irate. He was, he was freaking out. He was saying, Jay, help me. These guys, just help me. These guys are going to kill me. Did you observe his condition? He had fresh blood on his face. Across his nose. I couldn't see all that well, but he had his face to the window. And he was yelling at me, asking me to help, asking me to help him. A few days later, Neil Stonechild's frozen body was found in a field in the city's North Industrial Area. Since the day she was told about Neil's death, his mother has been looking for answers. Dawn Worm is helping her find them. What is interesting about Jason's evidence is that he had been asked by the officers in the vehicle where, that Neil was in the back of, uh, who he was, and he had given them a false name. And interestingly enough, those officers, and the records show this, uh, ran a CPIC check on the name that Jason had provided to them. In my estimation, that had certainly provided a, a sense of, uh, of confirmation and credibility to what Jason had told us. The inquiry is starting to make a lot of people nervous and involves a larger cast of characters. In total, 63 witnesses will appear, all to be questioned by the room full of lawyers. Oliver Williams and Annette Ermine of the Special Investigations Unit follow the inquiry closely. Constable Mackey was at the inquiry and he had admitted on the stand that there are members that do drop off individuals. The only thing that he, he, ter he didn't utilize, he didn't say drop off, he termed it as an arrest, but still, it still means the same thing. So it caused quite a controversy at the, at the inquiry. So did he say that that practice is still, still happening continues. today? It still continues, and he had also said that um, even though he termed it on arrest, it's done without the individual's consent. That's what he had admitted to on the stand. Pretty, uh, pretty big step for him to say something like that. I think that we should monitor that. Yeah, I, I think we'll have to stay on top of that. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's cool. Mr. Commissioner, the next witness is Constable Larry Hartwig. A familiar face takes the stand. Larry Hartwig, the newly appointed community liaison officer, is implicated as being one of the two officers Neil Stonechild was last seen with. The computer records show that Hartwig ran the false name given by Jason Roy. Did you, sir, have Neil Stonechild in your custody on November 24th or 25th of 1990? No, I did not. Is it possible, sir, that you mistakenly had him in your custody in the sense that perhaps he was in your custody, gave you a false name, and you didn't realize it was Neil Stonechild. Do you think that's possible? No, I do not believe that's possible. Hartwig is cross-examined about the details of the RCMP task force investigation. He was first contacted in the spring of 2000 and was interviewed 10 to 12 times as a suspect in Neil's death. 
In one interview, when the RCMP investigator asked about the freezing deaths of Aboriginal men, Hartwig had volunteered Neil Stonechild's name. You were talking to the RCM police about the death of people, right? Human beings. Correct. Frozen to death, Correct. right? Inexplicably. Correct. And there was some suggestion at that point in time, even in the media, uh, that there was some kind of involvement by the Saskatoon Police Service. Correct. You were quite aware of that? Yes, I was. So you didn't try for a moment to downplay the seriousness of this. You knew going into your discussions with Staff Sergeant Lyons that this is a serious situation. Absolutely. Right. And so you turn the conversation to the death of Neil Stonechild, right? I turn the conversation to Neil Stonechild. Sergeant Lyons turned the conversation to the death of Neil Stonechild. Now, am I missing something here? Isn't that the same thing? So. Is that the same thing? No, it's not. All right. Why would you even raise the name of Neil Stonechild? Isn't that what you're asking, Mr. Wood? I was what, trying, to, trying to get to that. What earthly situation? reason would there be for you to mention the name uh, Neil Stonechild in this context? Because I knew the RCMP were investigating the death of Neil Stonechild. They asked me about people I did not know about. The only person that I knew was Neil Stonechild. Larry Hartwig and his former partner, Brad Sanger, are on the stand for two days. As the inquiry winds down, the commissioner is left to wade through questions raised during the six months of testimony. Why was Neil's mother told that his death had been thoroughly investigated even though evidence shows otherwise? Why did the investigating officer, shortly before his retirement, burn Neil's clothes? How did Neil Stonechild end up dying alone in a field wearing only one shoe. Everyone anxiously awaits the commissioner's report. It's murder as far as I'm concerned. There was no question that whoever dropped them off out here knew that he had hardly any chance to get back. There was, there was and to me, uh, I'm convinced that he was possibly unconscious when he was dropped here too. And so if you drop someone off in minus 26 degree weather that's been uh, beat up, uh, has got marks on him, he's not going anywhere. He's not going to go anywhere but from that spot that he's dropped on the ground. And it's a healing thing for us because we, everybody's remembering him with us at the memorial round dance. The reason why we make the round dance and, uh, is to heal ourselves and, uh, and get together. He loved round dance too. Yeah. Elders, when they hear and know of families that are in pain, specifically the Wegner family, we had a lot of sweats for that family. And asking the Creator to give them courage, acceptance, and we also prayed, you know, for the victims. We know that they are in the spirit world, so we have ceremonies in which we honor them. I do want closure on this. I want, I want answers, and there never has been any answers. We're still dealing with, with un unanswered questions to what happened to this human being. And it could be anybody's child. And I think anybody out there that would have had this happen to them would want to know what and how th this happened. And uh, we still don't know. We still don't really know the truth. 
I never forget my son when it's cold out there. It doesn't bother me when I'm shaking and cold, eh? because he was out here freezing. I can go inside and get warm, but he never got that chance. He wasn't given the opportunity to save himself. I know he wanted to live. Well, I'm happy to be alive. To those cops tried to take my life. And I value my life. Nobody deserves that. No matter what nationality they are. Black guys, white guys, Indian guys, nobody. Cold out. 